Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about forces of friction, starting off with static friction, which is represented by F subscript S. This is the frictional force between two stationary objects. On the other hand, kinetic friction, which is represented by F subscript K, is the frictional force between two moving objects. The coefficient of friction, which is represented by mu s or mu k, relates the force of friction between two objects to the normal force acting at the surfaces of those objects. This only depends on the surfaces involved, so the type of material. Other factors don't come into play here, such as surface area. Elaborating on this further, static friction has the formula fs is less than or equal to mu s times normal. Static friction opposes the force applied to an object, and it increases as the applied force increases until the max static friction is attained. After exceeding this max static friction, kinetic friction takes over, and it has the formula fk is equal to mu k times normal force. Kinetic friction opposes the motion of the object, and it only acts after overcoming static friction. It's also important to note here that static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. Also, the frictional force is proportional to the normal force in both cases, which means that if the normal force is increased, this also increases the frictional force. If you look to the bottom here, you'll see that there's also a graph of static friction versus kinetic friction. So as you can see, the static friction increases as the applied force increases until the max static friction is attained, in which case it switches over to kinetic friction, which is lower than the max static friction. So I've divided this into the static region, which is before the object begins to move, and the kinetic region, which is after the object starts moving. Lastly, before going on to problem solving, we're going to go over some misconceptions with the force of friction. The first one being that the normal force isn't always equal to mg. So for example, if your object is on an incline, we know that the net force in the y component is zero, and it's equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force's y component. The y component of the gravitational force is related through cos, since that's the adjacent side relative to theta. So normal force in this case is mg cos theta. So watch out and always make sure to solve for your y component first whenever solving for friction because you can find out what the normal force is equal to. The second misconception is that friction is always opposite the direction of motion, which is not the case. An example of this is running shoes, which have a high coefficient of static friction. You'll see that in the second free body diagram, there's obviously the normal and gravitational force acting on your foot, but there's also the applied force in the backwards direction. You note know that what drives the person forward is actually the static friction, because if the running shoes did not have a high static friction coefficient, if you applied a force backwards on your floor, you'd actually slip. For example, think ice. So because your shoes have that high coefficient of static friction, when you apply a backward force on the floor with your foot, the floor applies a forward force opposing the attempted motion of your foot. The force of static friction is what allows you to accelerate forward. So in this case, friction is the same direction as your motion. Now that we've gone through other theory, let's go through solving the end of section problems from the Nelson textbook. Starting off with page 90, number 3. You are trying to slide a sofa across a horizontal floor. The mass of the sofa is 2.0 times 10 to the 2 kilograms. You need to exert a force of 3.5 times 10 to the newtons to make it just begin to move. Calculate the coefficient of static friction between the floor and the sofa. So in order to solve for part A, we're solving for the mu s, and we have mass and applied force. Starting off with that free body diagram, we have the normal force and gravitational force acting, as well as the static friction which opposes the applied force, and then of course the applied force in the forward direction. So letting upwards and forwards be positive, first solving for net force in the y component, which is equal to zero since there's no acceleration in the y component, zero is equal to normal force minus gravitational force, in this case, the normal force is equal to mg, but that's because it's sliding across a horizontal floor. Applying this normal force to the net force's x component, net force in the x component is equal to applied force minus static friction, 
Since the sofa has just began to move, set the net force in the x component to be equal to zero, which is equal to applied force minus the coefficient of static friction times normal. Normal is equal to mg. Isolating for the coefficient of static friction, you get that static friction's coefficient is 0 0.18. For part b, it says that after the sofa starts moving, the sofa reaches a speed of 2 meter per second after 5 seconds. Calculate the coefficient of kinetic friction between the sofa and the floor. Since we're given three pieces of info that relates to kinematics, we know that we can use one of the big five equations. So we have initial velocity, which is zero, final velocity, which is two meter per second, the change in time, which is five seconds. Again, we have mass and applied force, and we're solving for a coefficient of kinetic friction. We have the same free body diagram here as we did in part A, except that the subscript S has been replaced with a K to represent kinetic friction. Again, letting upwards and forwards be positive. First, we're solving with kinematics in order to solve for acceleration. We know that acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Since the sofa starts at rest, you can cancel initial velocity, or in this case, speed, since it's just magnitudes. That gives you a magnitude of acceleration of 0 0.40 meter per second squared. Now applying this acceleration to the forces, we know that F is equal to ma through Newton's second law, and there's only acceleration in the x component. So the net force in the x component is equal to ma, which is equal to the applied force minus the kinetic friction. So ma is equal to the applied force minus the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force, which we solved to be mg. Isolating for coefficient of kinetic friction, we get that's equal to 0 0.14. Comparing this to the coefficient of static friction, you can quickly verify that these two answers make sense since static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. Moving on to question number four. A crate is placed on an adjustable inclined board. The coefficient of static friction between the crate and the board is 0 0.29. Part A says, calculate the value of theta at which the crate just begins to slip. So we know mu s is equal to 0 0.29, and we're solving for theta. So we're using that problem-solving tip where we rotate the reference frame to allow for the most forces to be in the perpendicular components as possible. That allows the normal force to be in the upwards direction, static friction to be in the backwards direction, and then gravitational force is in the forward direction, but at a diagonal. So letting upwards and forwards be positive, again starting off with the y component of the net force, which is equal to zero since there's no acceleration in the y component. Zero is equal to the normal force minus the gravitational force's y component, which is mg cos theta. We know this because the y component is the adjacent side relative to theta. Isolating for normal force, fn is equal to mg cos theta. Now solving for the net force's x component, Fx is equal to the gravitational force's x component minus the static friction. The x component of gravitational force is mg sine theta since that's the opposite side relative to theta, and then minus mu s times the normal force which we just solved for. Isolating for mu s, we get that it's equal to tan theta, so theta is equal to the inverse tan times the coefficient of static friction, which gives you 16 degrees when rounding to two sig figs. As for part b, determine the acceleration of the crate down the incline at this angle when the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.26. So we're using theta is equal to 16.17 degrees, which was solved for in the previous slide. We know mu k is equal to 0 0.26, and we're solving for acceleration. So again, using the same free body diagram, except this time, the subscript s has been replaced with k to represent kinetic friction instead of static friction. Since we're working with finding the acceleration, there's only an acceleration in the x component, so we know we're working with the net force's x component. So ma is equal to mg sine theta minus mu k times n. Isolating for acceleration, plugging all the numbers in, which we already know, acceleration is calculated to be 0 0.28 meter per second squared down the incline. Now for number six, two blocks are connected by a massless string that pass over a frictionless pulley. The coefficient of static friction between m1 and the table is 0 0.45. The coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.35. Mass 1 is 45 kilograms and mass 2 is 12 kilograms. Part A asks if this system is in static equilibrium and asks us to explain. To find out if this system is in static equilibrium, we know that the net force must equal to 0. 
So that's the criteria we're checking here in order to explain if the system is in static equilibrium or not. Starting off with mass 1, we're solving for the net force's y component since we have to know the normal force in order to find the static friction force. So setting Fy is equal to 0, 0 is equal to the normal force minus gravitational force so that the normal force is equal to m1 times gravity. As for mass 1's x component force, Fx is equal to the tension force, which is in the forward direction, minus static friction. So static friction is mu s times m1g, since we just solved m1g to be normal. You'll see that I let Fx equal to x instead of equal to 0, since we're not sure if the system is in static equilibrium. So if x is less than or equal to 0, the system should be in static equilibrium, since it tells us that the static friction is greater than the tension force. On the other hand, if x is greater than 0, then it wouldn't be in static equilibrium because mass 1 would be pulled forward. Since we don't know the tension force, we have to solve for this using m2. Since tension force is the only unknown force in m2, we can easily solve for that by letting Fy equal to 0 since there's no acceleration. 0 is equal to tension minus gravitational force, and you see that the tension force is equal to m2 times gravity. Now going back to mass 1, x is equal to m2g, which represents tension, minus the static friction, which is mu s times m1g. Calculating that using the numbers we know, x is equal to negative 80.85 newtons, which tells us static friction is greater than the tension force. Therefore, the system is in static equilibrium. Part B asks, determine the tension in the string. We already solved for the formula of tension, which is just m2g. Plugging those numbers in, you get 1.2 times 10 to the 2 newtons when applying two sig figs. For part C of this question, a mass of 20 kilograms is added to mass 2. Calculate the acceleration. Adding 20 kilograms to mass 2 gives 32 kilograms. Again, we know mu s, mu k, and we know mass 1. Solving for acceleration, we know that the acceleration would be in the x component for mass 1, but in the y component for mass 2. Because referring to the free body diagram shown above, you'll see that mass 2 doesn't have any x forces acting on it, and since it's the hanging mass, the acceleration is in the y component. So we're analyzing each of those free body diagrams separately, but then adding them together to consider the system as a whole. Starting off with mass 1, we know that the net force's x component is equal to tension minus the kinetic friction. So m1a is equal to tension minus mu k times normal force. Previously, we solved normal force to be mg. Applying that specifically to the free body diagram of mass 1, it'd be mu k m1g. For mass 2, the net force in the y component is just equal to gravitational force minus tension force. Again, applying Newton's second law, m2a is equal to m2g minus ft. Adding those two equations together, m1 plus m2 times acceleration, since the system experiences the same acceleration, is equal to m2g minus tension force plus tension force minus mu k m1g. Isolating for acceleration, you get that the acceleration is 2.1 meter per second squared downwards along the pulley. Moving on to question number 7, a block of rubber is placed on an adjustable inclined plane and released from rest. The angle of the incline is gradually increased. Part A says, the block does not move until the incline makes an angle of 42 degrees to the horizontal. Calculate the coefficient of static friction. So we know that theta is equal to 42 degrees and we're solving for mu s. Again, rotating that reference frame to allow for the most forces to be in the perpendicular components as possible, and allowing forwards and upwards to be positive. Solving for that net force in the y component first, as we know, there's no acceleration in the y component, and we need to solve for normal force. You'll note that since it's at an incline, the normal force is equal to mg cos theta, again because the y component is the adjacent side relative to theta. Solving for the net force in the x component, since the block doesn't move yet, it's equal to zero, and this is equal to mg sine theta, which is the x component of the gravitational force, minus mu s times the normal force, which is mg cos theta, and this is the static friction force. Isolating for mu s, you get that's equal to tan theta since mg cancels 
Therefore, the static friction coefficient is 0 0.90. For part B, the block stops accelerating when the incline is at an angle of 35 degrees to the horizontal. Determine the coefficient of kinetic friction. So the block has stopped accelerating, so we know that net force in the x component again is 0, since acceleration is 0. Applying the same concepts as in part A, except this time using the coefficient of kinetic friction, replacing all the subscript s's with k's, mu k is still equal to 10 theta, so mu k is equal to 0 0.70. Again, this makes sense because the coefficient of kinetic friction is less than that of static friction. Last but not least, we'll be working on problem number 8. So two masses connected by a massless string hang over a pulley that connects two inclines. Mass 1 is 8 kilograms, mass 2 is 12 kilograms. The coefficient of kinetic friction for both inclines is 0 0.21. Determine the acceleration of the two masses. So we're going to let upwards and to the right be positive, so around that pulley. We know mass 1, mass 2, mu k, theta 1, theta 2, and we're solving for acceleration. So we're going to draw separate free body diagrams for mass 1 and mass 2. First of all, mass 1. You'll note that, again, I rotated the reference frame. Normal force is acting in the upwards direction. Tension force is acting in the rightwards direction, which represents the forwards force. The kinetic friction acting in the leftwards direction, which represents the backwards force. And then gravitational force acting diagonally in the backwards direction, with theta being the angle of elevation of the ramp. Since we're solving for acceleration, and we know that acceleration is only in the x component, that's the component we'll be working in. The first thing to all forces problems involving friction is to solve for the y component in order to find the normal force. In the middle here, I've solved for the y component of the net force. Since it's at an incline, we know the normal force is equal to mg cos theta. Of course, when we're analyzing the two free body diagrams, we'll be specifying the normal force to those specific diagrams. So for example, in free body diagram for mass 1, the net force in the x component is tension minus the gravitational force's x component minus kinetic friction. M1a is equal to the tension force minus m1g sine theta 1, since the x component of the gravitational force is the opposite side relative to theta 1, minus mu k m1g cos theta 1. Since we're analyzing this for mass 1, you'll note there's a subscript 1 for mass and theta. Moving on to free body diagram number 2, which is for mass 2, both the tension and kinetic friction act in the backwards direction, which is to the left, whereas gravitational force is diagonally in the forward direction, again theta equaling the angle of elevation of that ramp, so theta 2, and then finally the normal force acting in the upwards direction. Again, acceleration is only in the x component, so the net force in the x component is equal to the gravitational force's x component minus tension force minus kinetic friction. Applying this specifically to m2, m2a is equal to m2g sine theta 2 minus tension force minus mu k m2g cos theta 2. Considering the system as a whole, we're just adding these two equations together. So m1 plus m2 times acceleration is equal to the tension force minus m1g sine theta 1 minus mu k m1g cos theta 1 plus m2g sine theta 2 minus tension force minus mu k m2g cos theta 2. Isolating for acceleration and calculating using all the numbers we already have, acceleration is equal to 0 0.28 meter per second squared down that right incline. That wraps it up for this video. Stay tuned for next time to learn about inertial and non-inertial frames of reference.